This will be a little shorter this week because there's a Bears game. No, I'm kidding. Because, because of uh, the meditation is uh, the call of the king. The call of the king. This is how St. Ignatius leads into the second week of the spiritual exercises. It's a beautiful meditation, uh, but it's a simple one. The call of the king. We're, we're called to imagine first a, a human king, a fictional human king, because I don't think there's ever been a king or a president who is like this in our Earth's history. And then to picture Christ the king. And just to, to see the beauty of this king and his attractiveness and his goodness, and just to sit before that. It's a, it's a long meditation in the sense of Ignatius has a lot of parts and points and preludes, but it's a, it's a simple meditation at heart because it's all about us just beholding a, a beautiful king and seeing as we behold this beautiful king, our heart's desire to want to be with this king and do what he does and follow him wherever, wherever he goes. So it's a more enjoyable meditation, certainly, than the previous meditation, which was on hell. Uh, so hopefully this is a little easier in the sense and a, a little more effective, I guess you could say, affective of your heart. Ignatius first says to compose a place in your mind And he tells you to imagine the synagogues, villages, and the towns where Christ our Lord preached. That's the first prelude. So think in your mind, see those huts and synagogues and and stone and mud buildings that Jesus went to in, in the Holy Land in Galilee and Jerusalem. Don't just think about the, the messages that Jesus preached like in an abstract way as if you were reading them strictly in the Bible or hearing them in a lecture hall. But see, see real, real places, sacred, profane, blessed, and cursed places, places that are enriched, impoverished, where Jesus went. I remember when I went through this meditation on my own 30-day retreat, uh, my imagination was was on fire here, and I could I could see the the clay and the stone buildings in Galilee from two thousand years ago, and the towns, uh, both the rural countryside towns and villages where Jesus went, and then also the seaside villages where Jesus went. And after a while, beyond just the buildings and the the type of commerce that was going on there, or the lack thereof. I saw it really was at the heart of these towns and villages. And at the heart of it was both a people and a a place that was was suffering, that was longing, that was yearning for something more. Do you remember those, I don't know if they still have them, those commercials that that you used to see of missionaries, you know, in like poor African villages and they... They show, you know, the, the little children without shirts that are, you know, bloated bellies and, you know, they don't have running water. And, and the people there are just in dire poverty. That, that's kind of what I imagine. Even places that seemed wealthy on the surface. So, you know, Galilee was actually a, a fairly well-to-do town, but Jerusalem and uh, in the areas also uh, where the Romans had, had more of an established place, even in these wealthy places, there was still this hunger and this poverty, this people that were burdened, people that were tired, people that were exhausted, people that were forsaken. It was like a cauldron of, of pain. That, that's what I was able to see as the good king went to these places. And, and after a while, my imagination, it was bizarre, but I shouldn't be surprised because I'm just bizarre to begin with. Um, but the towns of Galilee morphed, in my imagination, to Chicago. Uh, Chicago and the suburbs, Edison Park and Park Ridge and, you know, Winneka, where I grew up, and, and, and this area. that had similar, you know, we might seem like we're, we're okay, but really we're a hunched over people that are, that are tired. We need a savior. We need a good king. We need a beloved 
a beloved son of God the Father who is good and who we can trust. At the sight of the crowds, his heart was moved with pity for them because they were troubled and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. That's Matthew 9, 36. That's kind of what I saw in my imagination. I just say that to maybe help you with your own imagination to see these places that Jesus was going to. And so we see immediately the impact that the king is going to have because these suffering people, they're in darkness looking for the light. This good king, first it's a human king, but like I said, this human king morphs into Christ the king. This good king comes to these people and he speaks to them. He appears, he speaks, he commands. And in our imagination, Ignatius tells us, see how delighted these people are that are suffering, to have their, their, their anguish relieved. They finally get what they, they want, not, not money or some new order, but, but a man who loves them, a king who's powerful. In the first part, first point, Ignatius says, all Christian princes and people pay homage and obedience to him. Okay, this is the good king. Now, this might be difficult, and I remember on the retreat, too, my spiritual director warned me, it's hard because we have so many images of, of kingly or authority figures that, not to be all political, but that aren't good. Good in the fullest sense of the way Christ is good. Every human king or queen, president, prime minister, whatever, is, is going to disappoint. But not Christ the king. Here is a king that is purely selfless. There's no ego involved. He's not self-absorbed. He doesn't have an ulterior motive. He's not trying to climb the ladder or, or, or anything, you know, for, for power or fame or glory or wealth. There's nothing in that in Christ the King. Whereas sometimes maybe we have an image of, our, of a political, political king that might be doing it for, for not quite the wrong reasons. But in this meditation, we can trust so if it's hard for you to imagine such a person, well then, you try. Use your imagination. This is the imaginary friend that you've always wanted, right? The imaginary king. Imagine someone that is truly trustworthy, who you can completely give yourself to, and who's going to do what's right for you, for you, for your soul, for your loved ones, for the world. So we can appreciate, we can respect this king. And Ignatius tells us then to ask for this grace to not to be deaf to the king's call, but prompt and diligent to accomplish his most holy will. So to be prompt and diligent in responding to the king. So the the king comes to these towns and villages and he gives his speech and he makes his commands. And what Ignatius is telling us to do is when he gives that command, we should just be instantly ready to follow and do whatever he says. Now, you might have a friend or a sibling that, or, or think of someone, if it's not a friend or sibling, who, if they were to ask you a favor, you would do it in a heartbeat because you, you utterly respect this person. You're, you're mesmerized by this individual. Uh, you, in a way, you're, in a good way, you're jealous of the person. They have so many gifts and talents, and you just want to be near them. And if they were to ask you to do something, ask you for a favor, you wouldn't hesitate. You would do it in a second. When Jesus asks us to do something, we want to have that same reaction, that we don't think twice about, oh, I got a Bears game I got to watch, or like from the gospel, you know, let me first bury my father, and then I'll go and follow you, Lord. No, we don't want to be like that. We want to instantly follow the Lord's call. And to be able to do that, though, we have to see Jesus as someone who is the fulfillment of our heart's desire. Because we do fundamentally, I believe, desire to want to be obedient to a king, to follow not ourselves and not our own will, but to, to follow someone above us, outside of us. Yes, we, we go around preaching, you know, independence and, you know, democracy and freedom and all these things. And yeah, they're not bad in the political realm, but, but truly we want to be subjects. We want to be subjects to, to God, to Christ. So let yourself be enthralled by this good king. So in back to Ignatius' exercise, 
he provides, Ignatius does, the, the speech of the king. And the king says, quote, It is my will to conquer all the lands of the infidel. Let me just stop right there. So Ignatius is using medieval language, so cut him some slack here. It is my will to conquer all the lands of the infidel. Therefore, whoever wishes to join with me in this enterprise must be content with the same food, drink, clothing, etc. as mine. So too he must work with me by day and watch with me by night, etc. That as he has had a share in the toil with me afterwards, he may share in the victory with me. So basically the king, we're gonna, the king comes to us and says, follow me. You're going to live the exact way that I'm living. You're going to eat what I eat. You're going to drink what I drink. You're going to sleep when I sleep. You're going to sleep where I sleep. You're going to pray. You're going to do all the disciplines that I do. We're going to imitate the king. We're going to do exactly like the king does. And that to us at first might seem a little different. No, I don't want to do that. I, I'd rather... I'd rather sit on the couch, and, and, or I'd rather do my own thing. I want to be self-reliant. But that won't bring us the true freedom that we desire. That won't bring us ultimate fulfillment and satisfaction. Giving ourselves to Jesus, giving ourselves to the King, will give us that fulfillment and freedom and satisfaction. That's why he's a good King, and we can trust him. Because he will give us what will truly set us free. So imagine what I had also come up in my mind is the king elaborating or expanding upon his, his orders, not just to eat and sleep and drink what he's doing, but give up your phone. Be in silence for 30 days. Don't worry about sports. Don't worry about the parish. Don't worry about your clothes. Now, as I'm saying that, maybe some things are coming up in, in you. What is God telling you to let go of? Forget about your books or your, the stuff you have in your basement or the, the trinkets on your shelf or your car that you rub with a diaper. You know, let go of that stuff, right? Follow me and trust that when you let go of that stuff, you're going to be happier than your attachment to it. So then Ignatius says in the third point, consider... Another way to kind of look at it, consider what the answer of good subjects ought to be to a king so generous and noble-minded. And consequently, if anyone would refuse the invitation of such a king, how justly he would deserve to be condemned by the whole world and looked upon as an ignoble knight. So in other words, what Ignatius is saying in your imagination, imagine someone that doesn't follow the king, that rejects the king's call, and just how utterly stupid that would be. That's another way to look at how good the king is and and what he's calling us to is actually what we want. It'd be like rejecting, you know, food or medicine that's going to save us. So again here, when you're picturing the king, it's kind of a fitting meditation, by the way, for this political season, isn't it? Don't picture who you think your, your beloved king is. So don't imagine... John F. Kennedy or Ronald Reagan. Don't imagine Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Okay, now if the Holy Spirit prompts you to think of those individuals, if those are your good kings, then follow the Holy Spirit. But what the point is, not so much the face of the king, but your heart and how you you just, you long to break out of your heart, break out of the, the shackles of your heart, to lift up the gates, the mighty gates of your soul, and to give yourself to this king. Again, not so much the face of the king, but, but just how your heart longs, longs for such a king. And then, like I said, it transforms into Jesus. He is the king that will fulfill your heart's desire. Let, Lord is king, let the earth rejoice, let all the coastlands be glad. Psalm 97, 1. What's also just a little prayer technique here that's beautiful about this meditation, it's simple in a way that it, it helps with distractions. So if, as you're trying to picture this king and you following the king and whatever his, his speech is and what he's calling you to do, it's easy to begin to moralize, to say, oh, I want to follow the king, but I just don't think I'm going to be able to. I'm too attached to my material possessions. 
Or you might be distracted, start easily drifting in your mind to, okay, great meditation, but I've got these emails or I've got to answer or there's a difficult situation at home or work that I've got to handle or I have to go get my flu shot at the end of the week or go to the DMV and so I'm distracted. What Ignatius is saying is don't think about that stuff. He's being very simple and childlike with us. Just He's basically telling you the exercise right now is to do 10 push-ups. Just do 10 push-ups right now. Don't do 10 jumping jacks. Don't do sit-ups. Don't think about how you're going to get strong or weak or that you won't be. Just do 10 push-ups. Put your head down, be a Neanderthal, and just do it, right? So don't think. Don't think about you know, whether you can follow this king or what's going to happen when you follow the king or how you're going to be a saint or a sinner. Just sit before the, the beautiful king. Just sit before him. Because what's going to happen then, as you sit before the king, it's going to lead you into the second, the, the second week in the various meditations and exercises. Think of the, the women of the New Testament. The women of the New Testament who just were by the side of Christ. The way, the way John was at the Last Supper. They, they reclined at the Lord's breast. They, they stood and just gazed upon upon Jesus Christ, and they were transformed. Think of the, these women of the, the New Testament. You've got Mary Magdalene, Martha and Mary, the Samaritan woman, even the mother of Jesus. All women that just by looking and being near Jesus, being at his side, were set free and were liberated. The Samaritan woman at the well, who had to go in the middle of the day to fetch water because she was embarrassed, about her marital history, she was hiding, is near Jesus, in front of the king's presence, and she's set free. She finds her true identity in Christ. Martha, who's beset with anxiety in the kitchen, is set free. Mary Magdalene, who's possessed by seven demons, sees Jesus, sees his heart, and she becomes the apostle of the apostles. Right? And the Blessed Mother at the foot of the cross, too. So when we just are near the side of Christ and focusing just on him and not on ourselves, we, we find our identity. We're, we're set on our, on our path. We become who we're meant to be. St. Ignatius ends the meditation with a prayer to offer yourself. He says to choose, quote, to imitate the... God in bearing all wrongs and all abuse and all poverty, both actual and spiritual. Should thy most holy majesty deign to choose and admit me to such a state and way of life. So what will happen is we make this choice, but it will become easy for us that we will bear whatever the king bears. Christ the king bared wrongs, abuse, poverty on the cross. Think of his trial before Pilate, mockery. We'll do all that, and we won't, we won't flinch. Think of it. God, the King, who is all-powerful, all-creative, all-unique, all-knowing. The God who made the stars, who calls each one of the stars by name, has made each one of you. He is your King. And when you are near him and you follow him and you let go of your own plans, you, are, you become that star, that star of heaven. Star of the sea like Mary. As a spiritual director once told me, God's plan B is always better than our plan A. So, yes, please, lift your heads, you mighty gates, all of you, you mighty gates. Let the king of glory enter and rule your soul. Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen.